Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Emily Dry Belbus is here, and we are so excited uh, this week because we've got a great story about how AI is making its way to the Olympics by way of Google's Gemini. What that means, the impact that it might have on journalists and uh, Olympic specialists, and then also another story about how tech may have been used to cheat ahead of the Olympics. Afterward, my story of the week covers one of my favorite topics, it's sleep science, and how Google's Fitbit data has been used for one of the largest sleep studies that we've ever had. Afterwards, Lisa Edichico of CNET stops by to talk about the Samsung Galaxy AI features that rock and those that don't so much. Before we round things out with Brian Merchant of Wired, who joins us to talk about how AI is taking jobs in the video game industry. All of that coming up on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly with Emily Dry Belbus and me, Micah Sargent, episode 346, recorded Thursday, July 25th, 2024. Gemini's Olympic debut. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking that tech news. I am your host, Micah Sargent, and I am joined this week by PC Mag's one and only Emily Drybelbus. Welcome back to the show, Emily. Hello, thank you. It's good to get you here. Good to have you. And of course, um, I mean, you may be the one and only Emily Drybelbus. I don't know, but certainly PC Mag's one and only. That would be weird if you worked with someone who had the exact same name as you, wouldn't it? What are the odds? Yeah, I mean, with my last name, there I do know of one, maybe two other women with my name. I've been tempted to start like a WhatsApp group. You should. You should. Just be like, we need to consolidate <laughs> <Tell me> power. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seize the means of production. Okay. Um, let's get into the stories of the week. For those who are listening in for the first time, the way that we kick off Tech News Weekly uh, each week is by starting with some stories of the week, one from my guest co host and one from myself. Uh, so, Emily, what are you bringing to the table this week? I want to talk about the Olympics. Um, I'm getting psyched about the Olympics. I watched a Simone Biles documentary on Netflix. Did you? Anyone else? I have not watched that. No. It's good. It's a good watch. Um, so I, what I wrote about this week was a little bit different. Um, so basically, NBC Universal, which owns rights to all the broadcast coverage of the Olympics, so basically what most of us are going to be watching, unless we are lucky enough to go to Paris, they partnered with Google and they're going to be incorporating Google's AI into the live coverage. So I just wrote about like, how the heck would that work? Um, there's three kind of components to the deal and like three things we might see on TV. Um, but the, we can just start with the first one, which is the reporters um, or the commentators who are on TV are going to be incorporating like question and answer with an AI chatbot during the coverage. Um, which just raises so many questions. <laughs> so like, weird. So I know a couple, two examples they gave. One is like maybe um, ways to explain different assets or aspects of the sport. So they were like, oh, the importance of lane assignments and swimming, like it can explain that. And there I'm like, I would hope that the person hired to comment That's on what I'm saying. That's what, <laughs> the, know that. that's what the commentator is for. <laughs> right. And the other one is like, you know, backstories on the athletes or like details about them that might come up. And it's like, I would also hope that a professional Olympics reporter would have like a printout on those people. So I just, I don't know, like, what would you, how would you feel if you were watching the Olympics and they just like asked a chatbot a question? I would immediately say, why do I need to hear from these people anymore? I mean, that's, that's why, because, because <laughs> in theory, you know, when watching uh, a, a a miraculous moment of 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 human ingenuity, especially like of the body, you are able to appreciate it. And at some point, someone came along and said, "You know what's valuable? 
somewhat distracting people from this moment of human ingenuity <laughs> by providing uh, little notes about what the person is doing. And ever since then, like sports commentary and commentary in general were born. And that's because, you know, we've agreed, I guess, that it provides extra value. So the moment that you show me that you can't provide value, that I could find that value, seek out that value myself, then I'm going, what's your point? Why are you here? <laughs> what You're just getting in the way of my brain kind of understanding what's happening in this moment. And yeah, in that way, I don't think that, that I, yeah, I, I suppose it, it kind of, it, it feels like it's coming for their jobs, frankly. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's true. I mean, I've seen videos of like fake newscasters generated by AI, and I don't know if it's going in that direction. I don't know exactly how it's going to go down. Like, are they going to say like, hold on one minute, let me ask Google? Because as a reporter myself, I would have to be paid a lot to do that because I think it makes you look like a fool a little bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It reduces yeah. your credibility if you're going, totally. I actually don't know this. I need to, because here's the thing. What I, I like the idea of, I, I don't, I don't like where it's being used. If Google put together, you know, some ads that were showing that if you were just because, OK, this, this is kind of multifaceted here. But think about how a lot of the video watching that takes place is done with the volume turned down. You know, you've got um, you've got captions on almost every video these days because a lot of people just scroll through and they watch the video but they don't necessarily listen to it and we're in places where maybe it's not you know convenient to be able to listen to what's what's going on so imagine someone kind of tuning into an olympics um moment and they're watching it but they've got other stuff going on or what have you and they have this moment where they go you know, it's kind of weird how the person on in this lane uh, seems to have an advantage in comparison to the person on this lane. Or maybe they don't even realize that, but they say, how come lanes are assigned, you know, by random? Or I honestly, I don't know how it works. But then you would, if Google showed, you could ask the chatbot that, and then you yourself would just know it. I think that's a cool thing. Or what if it, you remember those old um, MTV VH1 uh, pop-up video <laughs> Uh, episodes where it would be a reality show, but then they would pop up and it'd be like, the producers actually told them to do this or or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. I love that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I love those. The pop-up yeah. video episodes were great. You learned so much more. If there was some way to dynamically, you know, insert that, like, are you curious why this is happening? That is a clever way to kind of show the usefulness of, of Gemini, but to, mm -hmm. To do it this way, just I think it seems it seems bad. <laughs> You're very right that it, yeah. it makes you look bad. Yeah, I mean, to me, the Olympics is kind of a sacred space. This is like the one time the whole world comes together and we get like more patriotic. We're like excited about these athletes and, you know, it's in Paris and we're learning about Paris. So Google better not ruin it. Number one, like I don't want to see <laughs> corny corny AI stuff. Like we're, we've already had a whole year of that two years almost now, like <laughs> just let us enjoy the Olympics. We've been waiting four years, but we don't know what shape it's going to take. I think we could definitely expect some kind of ads, social media posts. I just, they listed specific people that are going to like talk to the AI that are commentators. So I'm just like wondering how that's going to play out. Um, I just hope they don't ruin it. I, I hope so too. I hope that they don't ruin it as well. Um, I am now though curious and I'm not going to lie that there would be, I don't, I wouldn't call it schadenfreude um, because that suggests deriving pleasure from it. And I don't think I would, I don't think I'd find it enjoyable to see it crash and burn, but I would find it fascinating. So to our German listeners out there, if you could tell me what the word for that is not deriving pleasure from someone else's folly, but um, deriving interest from someone else's folly. Uh, mm -hmm. That's capitalism. No, I'm kidding. Um, that's, that's how, <laughs> sorry, interest in the money sense. I don't know where my brain is today. Point is... Well, a lot of people... Yeah, a lot of people did drive pleasure from Google's AI failures, which is actually what I wrote about because when they first released their 
AI powered summaries on Google search. There were so many errors. Like it told people, it recommended people um, glue cheese on pizza to make it stick, which is from a Reddit post like 10 years ago, and like a satirical one. And the AI scraped it and pulled it. There were so many Twitter threads on that. It was told someone to eat a rock a day, told people to just answered questions incorrectly and some like totally absurd. So in some ways, I think this Olympics thing is a huge deal for Google to reclaim their AI dignity. Uh, so do you think <laughs> yeah. then, you think any of it will actually be live or do we even know? Do we know if it's going to see, what if it's not? What if these are canned? They've tested them ahead of time. They're in a very specific moments. Yeah. Mm. They're going to be partially mm -hmm. canned. I wonder if they will be live because it's such a a risk, but also I think they created a custom AI model for NBC's commentators. Oh. They're calling it something about the games. It's like uh, the games experience or it's, I, th I think they're going to try to make it seem like people could do this at home and that this is how their models work. And they're like always on topic. They're always perfect in answering exactly what you want to know, um, which is very much not the case <laughs> for Google's current, you know, just mass market AI products. I think they're going to give NBC a tinier, super Olympics focused model. And then it'll probably know already the questions they're going to ask it or, or something which is a bummer. Wow. It would be so much more fun for it to be live, but I just don't see Google like messing this up, you know? Yeah. I think I'm what, I, what I'll try to do then is wait for one of those segments, watch how it answers there, and then I'll just use Gemini and type in the same thing and see what mm -hmm. pops up that way. And then we can see exactly. how, yeah, how candid it is. Um, mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, at the same time, this could be a way for Google because where we've seen, um, Microsoft through OpenAI and even OpenAI itself and Anthropic, they all seem more focused on the, not more focused, but equally focused at least on the corporate side of things where you are uh, feeding your you know company's database into the system and then getting responses. Haven't seen that as much with Gemini, um, not as much and not as uh, used, I guess, uh, with Gemini outside yeah. of Google workspaces. So if this is a way to maybe show off the chops of watch what happens when we feed it custom data, but if they do that, then I think arguably they're not marketing to consumers. They're marketing to, mm -hmm. you know, people up the chain. So it'll be, yeah. it could be kind of a miss in that way. I don't think they're going to tell people it's a custom model. That's my Got theory. It. I think there's going to be it. like, look at how our AI works and they're going to have the interface. If they do like screenshots or they do some kind of live demo, I think they're going to have it look similar. I mean, I'm kind of get veering into like advertising conspiracy land or even, <laughs> I don't know if that's legal, misrepresenting the product. But I think it, it could be a sign of Google trying to position its AI as a more mass market product, just like Google.com mm -hmm. versus like you said, enterprise or Meta is doing all this open source stuff, which is really only something a, a skilled developer with a highly equipped computer could use, like all of right. those. So that's a totally different audience. And maybe by Google partnering with something as mass market, like everyone around the world's talking about it. Maybe they're trying to say like, you know, we're the every, every man, every woman's AI kind of thing. That makes sense. Well, uh, good luck to them. Uh, for sure. There was one more Olympics story that you wrote about, and it is involved. It does involve tech. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that before we take a break? Yeah, there was a scandal. Like the game's the opening ceremony hasn't even happened. We already have a scandal. Um, so one, there was an investigation because one team, the New Zealand women's soccer team was practicing and they heard a drone overhead and then they reported it to the Olympics police and found out that the Canadian women's soccer team was spying on them <laughs> with the drone. And then the Canadian team kicked off an investigation and found that a very, I guess, minor, they said unaccredited person on their coaching staff was recording the New Zealand team and they had done it three days earlier as well. So they had the New Zealand team posted a statement, FIFA posted a statement, Canadian soccer team posted a statement, people were fired, the coach is not going to you know, show up to the game. I guess that game actually happened today between those two teams. So yeah, we had a, had a drone scandal. 
Wow. And uh, sounds like a scapegoat if I ever heard one. This was from an unaccredited <laughs> person on the team. Yeah. Uh, they said, who's going to stand up and take uh, take the hit for this? It's mm -hmm. it's something that I never I, honestly, I give them credit. The the team who looked up and said, oh, that's bad, because if I was there, I would immediately think that it was just the press. I would have thought, oh, this is just early right. coverage going on. So the fact that they saw the drone, they reported it. That is uh, honestly credit where credit's due right away, yep. because I would have not thought of anything about it. Not, certainly not that there's spying going on. You know, it used to be you had to learn the other team's hand signals or something and then, I don't know, interrupt the radio frequencies. And now you're just flying a drone overhead. Wow. This stuff gets more and more complicated all the time. I know. And I love how it's the two countries I consider to be most innocent, like Canada yeah. and New Zealand. <laughs> like our Canada, <laughs> That's true. they're so nice. New Zealand has like the highest population of sheep on the globe, like per capita. <laughs> Just great places with cheaters. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Okay, we do have to take a quick break before we come back with my story of the week. I want to take a moment to tell you about Melissa, who are bringing you this episode of Tech News Weekly. Melissa are the data quality experts since 1985. Whether you need the full white glove service or just the nuts and bolts, Melissa is the best for your enterprise. Melissa has helped over 10 thousand businesses worldwide harness accurate data with their industry leading solutions processing more than one trillion address email name and phone records take advantage of melissa's data cleansing plugins for leading crm applications like clean suite for salesforce clean suite for microsoft dynamics crm listware and express entry desktop g2 continually recognizes Melissa, most recently as the leader of summer 2024, as well as leader in small business, best ROI, high performer, momentum leader, fastest implementation, easiest admin, best meets requirements. Melissa's services use secure encryption for all file transfers and an information security ecosystem built on the ISO 27001 framework. They also adhere to GDPR policies and maintain SOC to compliance. Melissa now offers transparent pricing for all its services so you can eliminate the guesswork when estimating your business budget. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. And we thank Melissa for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All right. So my story of the week, I will try not to spend too much time on it because as many of our listeners know, I am a huge sleep nerd. Um, I used to do a podcast about sleep science and dreams and have done a bunch of reading. I have uh, in, in the past subscribed to the journal Sleep. Love sleep science. think it's so fascinating. And uh, Google along with uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center and the National Institutes of Health's uh, All of Us Research Program have all um, worked on a study that was published in Nature Medicine about sleep and its impact on health. Now, overall, much of what was learned in this study is going to be stuff that many of us already know uh, because it's just a kind of further confirmation. But there's something unique about this study, first and foremost, that it is uh, so much larger than studies done before. Um, many times these studies are done in small sizes and they are uh, sort of done via what's called a sleep diary. So it is a subjective method of reporting sleep, as well as occasionally um, going in for a lab sleep study where the duration is a lot smaller. You know, maybe it's a 24 hour sleep study. Uh, you are or aren't using movement monitors over the course of a night. Basically, uh, I wouldn't call it shoddy, but something just a step or two above shoddy <laughs> is the way that uh, the sleep research that we've done at this scale has been up to this point. So 6,700 Fitbit users participated in the All of Us Research Program, which resulted in uh, the data from 6.5 million nights of sleep over the course of, on average, four and a half years of wear. 
And here's kind of a, a brief understanding of what was found. First and foremost, I think one of the things that we know more than anything else, sleep duration uh, played a huge role in someone's potential to also present with, you have to be very careful about how you word these things, uh, potential to also present with other diseases. So literally every additional hour of sleep over the uh, like lower median range resulted in significantly lower odds of having certain conditions like uh, sleep apnea and, and others, including anxiety, uh, depression, and some other conditions, as well as the idea that too much sleep could be associated with various conditions. So we know too little sleep is a problem, but too much sleep also could be an issue. Um, sleep stages, this is where things kind of start to break away from what the average person knows, but still what many of us know, which is that every single stage of sleep is important and the balance of those stages is very important. So getting enough REM sleep, light sleep, and deep sleep all play a role in heart health and mental well-being. So that even if you get enough uh, REM and light sleep, as we get older, the amount of deep sleep that we get, that stage three of sleep, uh, decreases. And we believe that that has a huge factor on aging. And that is because stage three of sleep is the most restorative stage of sleep. Restless sleep was also an issue. When people had more restlessness, they had a higher odd, they had higher odds of having a sleep disorder, which makes sense. In many cases, sleep disorders do involve restlessness, but also hypothyroidism. And then sleep irregularity. So if you are sleeping patterns had a wider range, um, then that could also result in issues for, they said, every organ system. High blood pressure, obesity, psychiatric disorders, migraine headache were all uh, tied in with sleep irregularity. And then I found this interesting. They found some demographic differences. First and foremost, on average, um, women tend to sleep longer than men in the study white participants slept longer than black participants and the reason that they talk about this is because those things are important to consider when it comes to researching and promoting sleep health how do do uh, demographic factors play into someone's overall sleep health and last but not least something that i've talked a lot about a lot of people think that alcohol is uh, a good way to help you get sleep. Alcohol helps you fall asleep. It is not good once you have fallen asleep because alcohol greatly impacts your stages of sleep and it kind of drops you down into stage three sleep and you stay there, but then you go, it's, it's, it messes up your circadian rhythm and causes this issue where you're not hitting all of the necessary stages of sleep as you go throughout the night. Cause as you know, you go uh, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage two, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage two, stage one, REM back down, back down. And with alcohol, you drop down into stage three and then it throws everything off for the rest of the night where you may not get enough REM sleep. And, uh, they showed that that was important in the rest of the study. All right. Now I got that out of the way. I could keep going, but I'm not going to because I will just go and go and go. I want to uh, open up this conversation to ask you, um, first and foremost, if you do any sleep tracking yourself and if you do kind of other health metrics and then, of course, what you thought about this study and if it confirmed anything that you suspected or maybe anything was a surprise to you. Yeah, well done. Good summary. I love that you're a sleep nerd, first and foremost. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good quality. Sleep is so important. Um, so I don't have a smartwatch. I have another watch here, but not a smartwatch. I don't track my sleep score like a lot of people do or body batteries or use any tech for that. And part of the reason is um, my partner, I guess now husband, I got married. Um, he used to track his sleep score and it would be like every morning, like, oh, what was your score? What was your score? And based on the score, it kind of set the tone for like the morning and the day. It's like, oh, I know mm -hmm. I got a low score. So it kind of like gets in your head. And I, I just felt like I didn't want an additional factor to make me anxious about like my performance for the day or to influence that. 
And Can I, I interrupt really, you briefly? Yeah. Just to, I just want to say you are literally describing something that has been so common in sleep that they had to give it a name. It is called orthosomnia. And the Journal, Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine uh, has a whole thing on orthosomnia. So I just want to say very valid, very real. And I feel that. Continue. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. And um, I felt validated by something else too. I interviewed this. Um, pitcher on the Chicago Cubs. I did an article on how he uses tech in his athletic performance. And he said that during the season, he does not track his sleep or a lot of his metrics for that reason. Like he Ooh. optimizes a lot in the off season, but he has to be so focused at the game that he doesn't want to be thinking like, oh, I had a low sleep score today. Oh, I had a low sleep score today. While there's like, you know, tens of thousands of people looking at him and he's on TV. Like he's like, that's the last thing I want to think about. So yeah, I'm just... I'm not tracking my sleep. I do. I'm. I became a little bit of a sleep nerd at one point too. So I mean, it's very important to me. Um, I guess as a white woman, as that study said, I'm sleeping great. I got no problems. <laughs> so yeah. Are you actually though? Do you feel like you're sleeping well? I do. I sleep. That's good. I can sleep a lot. I have trouble falling asleep. I don't know about you. What? Tell me about your sleep. Um, I don't have trouble falling asleep. But that is mostly because I've been in this. The one good thing about having allergies is that the allergy medication that I take, this, uh, oh, it's yes. called azelestine. And azelestine, I take right before bed. It's a nasal allergy and it helps me fall asleep. Um, but once I fall asleep, oh, buddy, I sleep well and I can sleep <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. Um, if I, if I wanted to, I, you know, got to get up in the morning, but I don't know. Sleeping is one of my favorite activities <laughs> to this day. I, I uh, actually sometimes would use Benadryl, like one Benadryl to just kick off sleep. If I, if I like really can't fall asleep, it's been like weeks. I'm like, you know what? I really just want to get back on track. Um, I would do that. But now I realize they sell the active ingredient in Benadryl just on its own. It's a product called Simply Sleep, just like CVS, Walgreens, whatever. So you don't actually have to take allergy medicine if you want like a little assistance. So that's a tip. Anyone nice. needs help falling asleep? Yeah. There you go. You can you can do that. So, um, yeah, orthosomnia was the other thing that I wanted to mention here uh, that has a huge impact on on folks enough that it does result in yeah. If you use that to kind of inform your day, then it can uh, have a significant impact not just on your day, but it starts to make you strive for good sleep. And if there's one thing to know, it's that striving for sleep is not going to help you get sleep. Sleep is something that just needs to happen. And so trying to push yourself to sleep is not something that's going to, to work out for you. But overall, again, a lot of this is just what you would imagine. It is the fact that uh, not getting enough sleep, not getting enough Sleep, good sleep and not sleeping regularly, what we call sleep hygiene, meaning going to bed around the same time, waking up around the same time, all have an impact on your overall health. And while we know this already, the good thing about it is there's just so much more now data available that researchers can look into, can pull apart, and can better understand what's going on. And I think that that is what makes this study so impactful and what I think is very cool about it in terms of, of um, all of the work that was done with the All of Us Research Program. I wanted to mention that too, if you are based in the US, uh, the National Institutes of Health have allofus.nih.gov and people can sign up to be a part of it. And it is just a research program that is trying to expand um, health awareness past what we have had up to this point in terms of understanding how environment, lifestyle, and every other factor, demographic factor plays. Um, as a person of color, I, for example, know that uh, the body of knowledge that we have in regard to skin is almost exclusively based on the skin of white folks. And so when I present with a skin condition, it is way more likely that I would be missed, that the, the, the condition would be missed 
on me than it would be on a white person because there are plenty of photos, there's plenty of research, there's plenty of training that's done around that. And so the All of Us Research Program is looking at that, among other things, to try to broaden that. So being a part of this program could help when it comes to just making sure that um, more information is available. Because when I heard about the um, the demographic factor of white participants sleeping longer than black participants, it made me think about... Um, the impact that uh, low income jobs might have on on a person and how uh, undesirable uh, job times might have on a person and how that could affect sleep regularity. I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. And so paying attention to all of that, I think is a very important thing. And I'm glad that, you know, this, that Fitbits are, much more affordable than this thing I'm wearing on my wrist, the Apple Watch, and that, you know, I see them on a lot of people and that folks are willing to, you know, in an anonymous way, supply their data um, to help kind of broaden our understanding of what's going on. And perhaps AI could help even more kind of dig into that, pull it apart and figure out the trends in a positive way. Uh, anything else that you'd like to say on that, Emily, before we say goodbye? I'll just pile on in, in support of what you're saying. So my sister actually works for the government. She works at the USDA. She w makes some of Ooh. the nutritional guidelines for the US and she does a ton of research and review. And she actually sent our family a link to that study when it was kind of getting going. And she was like, this is really exciting. Like this all of us study is like the best one. And so I'll just support you and say like, this is a really cool study and you are, you're definitely a very well read true sleep nerd if, if you came across it and others should check it out. That is awesome. That's really cool to hear. Thank you, Emily, for taking some time to join us today. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, I believe folks will be seeing you again next week. Um, Emily will be filling in for me while I am out next week. So we can look forward to having her back on. In the meantime, though, if folks want to keep up to date with what you're doing, where should they go to do so? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. Um, my username is electric underscore humans. I write a lot about um, EVs, AI, impact on society. So yeah, you can find me at electric underscore humans and I will see you next week. All right. Thank you, Emily. All right, folks, it is time uh, for a quick break before we come back with my first of two interviews. I want to tell you about 1Password, who are bringing you this episode of Tech News Weekly. All right, let me ask you this. Do your end users always work on company-owned devices and IT-approved apps? Yeah, I didn't think so. So how do you keep your company's data safe when it's sitting on all of those unmanaged apps and devices? How do you do it? Well, 1Password actually has an answer to this question. It's called Extended Access Management. 1Password Extended Access Management is the first security solution that brings all these unmanaged devices, apps, and identities under your control. It ensures that every user credential is strong and protected, every device is known and healthy, and every app is visible. It solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM just can't touch. Imagine your company's security like the quad of a college campus, for example. There are nice brick paths between the buildings. Those are the company-owned devices, IT-approved apps, and managed employee identities. <laughs> then there are the paths people actually use. These are actually called elephant paths. The shortcuts through the grass that are the actual straightest line from point A to point B. Those are unmanaged devices, shadow IT apps, and non-employee identities like contractors. Most security tools only work on those happy brick paths, but a lot of security problems take place on the shortcuts. One password, I love that. I love that. That's such a good metaphor. It's so true. One password extended access management is security for the way we work today. Available now to companies with Okta and coming later this year to Google Workspace and Microsoft Entra. So check it out at onepassword.com slash twit. That's one P A S S W O R D dot com slash twit. And we thank one password for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All righty, we are back from the break, and that means it's time for my first interview. 
You know, Samsung has been touting its own AI offerings for quite some time, but I'll be honest in saying that I haven't heard a whole lot about these Samsung features outside of just the company itself whenever it's made announcements about new products. So imagine my joy and excitement when I came across uh, an article that was finally a review of these Samsung Galaxy AI features. Lisa Edachico of CNET is here to talk to us all about it. Welcome back to the show, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, so let's um, start with kind of the, the latest and greatest. I would love to hear kind of the standout features that uh, Samsung introduced with the Samsung Galaxy S24 series and those latest foldable phones. What are the names of them before we kind of dig into what they can do? Yeah, for sure. So Samsung did announce most of these features back in January with the S24. There's features like circle to search, which of course, Google is a big part of that. Um, there's also some of the newer features like Sketch to Image and Portrait Studio, which I can elaborate about a little bit more in a bit. Um, and then there's Instant Slow Mo, um, Live Translate. So a lot of these features, you as you can probably guess just from their names, really have a lot to do with photo editing and language translation. Those are really two of the big areas that Samsung is leaning into, at least in the beginning, with its approach to AI on phones. Understood. Now. Let's start with circle to search. Um, you know, this is one that I think is quite flashy, uh, but it just seems so handy. How does it actually enhance the user experience on Samsung devices? And tell us about like when it's best used. Yeah, so circle to search really stood out to me because it does feel like it solves a problem of having to jump between apps to get this things done. So if you just want to look up something that you came across in maybe Instagram or X or Twitter or another social feed or even a game. It really it works in almost any app. All you have to do is kind of hold down that home button and draw a circle around it and it'll launch a Google search. Now, I do think a feature like this is going to take some time to catch on because we're all so used to it's like ingrained in like muscle memory to just switch between apps and and you know, type things that we're looking for. So I do think it's going to take some time to catch on, but I think it's such an interesting idea. And I, I personally have found it most useful for things like online shopping or looking for like restaurant recommendations. You know, those are the two things that I feel like come up a lot in like Instagram and things like that. So it, it's a really interesting way to kind of think about the user interface in a new way. Awesome. Now, let's talk about um, Portrait Studio and Sketch to Image. What again, especially as a demo, these are pretty cool, but where mm -hmm. are the places where somebody might find them, you know, actually useful or at least fun if, if, if we can't get all the way to useful? <laughs> yeah, and I think your question kind of touches on, I think, one of my issues with Samsung's approach to AI so far is that these features are very fun to use and play around with, but they might not always be super practical the way circle to search is. So for sketch to image, which basically lets you scribble a rough sketch on your phone and then it'll generate an image for you. Um, I think it could be useful if you're trying to add something to a picture. Um, you know, you can draw something in a photo and it'll generate it for you. If you are taking notes in the Samsung notes app and you want a rough sketch to accompany whatever your thoughts are you can draw something so i mean it could be useful i do feel like those use cases are a bit of a stretch especially the note taking one i think most of us are probably using different productivity apps to to yeah. keep track of our notes rather than samsung notes but i mean it does work and it is impressive to just kind of play around with it and the same goes for portrait studio i had way too much fun just taking selfies and pictures of my friends and pressing that little button to see what samsung would come up with it's it's almost like a fun party trick um and maybe if you want like a fun profile photo or something like that sure but in terms of like really changing how we use our phones i i feel like th these features aren't quite there yet does it take a long time um, to do those generations? Is it is it a is it a quick uh, feature when you're hitting that button, or is it one that gets sent off server side, happens on device, and and how long does it take to actually get your final rendering? It happens pretty quickly, honestly. Um, it doesn't take that long. I mean, there's a little bit of a pause, sure, but I've never. Um, come across a scenario where I've been like, oh my God, come on already, or just forget it because it's taking too long. I would say like it, it probably takes probably no, no longer than a minute, I would say, if that. Nice. 
Um, let's talk about then Samsung's chat assist. Uh, this is supposed mm -hmm. to, this is uh, as an aside, the, this feature as an AI feature in general across any, I mean, you know, I've got email applications that now have something like this. I've got, uh, you know, Apple is talking about introducing it in, in its various operating systems. And it's the one feature that really bugs me because it feels like my AI is going to be talking to someone else's AI. And I won't know if I'm talking to the person or talking to their AI. And it all just feels so disconnected. But that's my aside. Is Samsung's chat assist, uh, how does it help improve communication? And uh, maybe you can talk about those writing style adjustments if I suddenly want to sound like, you know, Bill Shakespeare or something. Yeah, so this is actually one of the features that I haven't found that useful. And it's mostly because the suggestions don't really feel authentic. A lot of the times mm. there's, they're just overly excited or there's a lot of emojis and hashtags sprinkled in them, which I, I don't, I mean, I use emojis, oh, of course, who doesn't, but, but hashtags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but hashtags, exactly. Right. So um, I've used these features to play around with them, but I don't really find myself using them in everyday use. Um, also, there's a new feature that Samsung just announced with its new foldables that can like not just rewrite what you wrote, but draft a text message or a social media post just based on a prompt. Um, the idea is really cool. I really wanted to like this a lot, but I just found it kind of hard to use. Not that the technology doesn't work, but that like it was hard to think of a prompt that would result in something that I thought would be actually useful. So I, I think these rewriting tools will be much more useful for email and things like that. Like maybe something where you do want to sound professional, you do want to sound polished, and you maybe don't want to take the time to like really think about writing a draft. Um, I, I think it's more useful for that. But for text messages, I'm like, I would just, my friends and family know how I sound. Like yeah. <laughs> they're going to know something's off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they suddenly be going, um, we need to make sure she's okay. Uh, yeah, I would be worried about that too. So then in chat, that's one thing. But there's also a live translate feature during phone calls. Is mm -hmm. that everything that, you know, humanity is hoping it could be? Is this the universal translator we've been waiting for? How is that? Yeah, I do think it's really interesting um, and it, it does seem to work, but it's also a little bit awkward to use. I think that's the case with some a few of these translation features. Um, for example, uh, when you're using this feature, you make a phone call and then you hit this button and then Samsung's AI translates the conversation in real time. But it's not always clear like when you should start talking and when you should stop and when the translation is going to kick in and the person on the other end, um, you know, it, it does announce that it's doing this. So it's not not a surprise it's not doing this in like a sneaky way or anything like that but um I, it's also something that people don't really expect yet so i think there is a little bit of just like a social awkwardness to it um which hopefully eventually um is a thing of the past and the technology is impressive but i do feel like it's a little bit um awkward to use it in everyday use and then lastly i'll ask you about generative edit um you know google itself and through Android, through Google Photos, offers some magic editing tools. And we've seen other applications make use of magic editors. How is generative edit? And do you think that it is, you know, powerful enough to be convincing? Or does it kind of fall on the side of not being interesting? <laughs> Yeah, so generative edit is really, really similar to Google's magic editor. It's it's basically the same thing. I haven't found a huge difference between the two other than the fact that Google presents more options when when you um, get an edited photo. It'll have like maybe three options you can swipe between. Uh, but I do think it's convincing, um, certainly convincing enough. If you look closely, though, you can tell that the photo has been edited or something's been changed or maybe there's a part of the photo that doesn't look quite natural but it is impressive to see how quickly these edits can happen and um i do think it'll make it a lot easier for people to touch up their photos maybe remove someone from the background that isn't supposed to be there maybe add something but um it also in my opinion does raise this question about authenticity of photos and, and what is a photo and at, at that point if you're changing so much of it that you're generating things that aren't there um what is the point of capturing that moment right i think that's like the question that right. a lot of people will be asking themselves as they're using these new features 
Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's going, okay, if I'm mm-hmm. just going to make this something totally different, then do I really even need to take the photo in the first place? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to do, again, what I had been looking for for so long. Uh, your your headline, after six months, these are my favorite Samsung Galaxy AI features. Uh, folks should definitely go to CNET to check out that article and read through it in depth to to get your in-depth understanding, the photos that you've posted, and all of the information there. Uh, If they do want to follow you online to keep up with what you're doing, where are some places they can go to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it these days, at Lisa Edichico, which is just my first name and my last name. Same thing goes for threads as well and LinkedIn. And of course, um, you will find my stories on CNET. So don't forget to check that out as well. Thank you so much for your time today, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. All righty, folks. We're going to take another quick break before we come back with another interview. I do want to tell you about BetterHelp. We're sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. Let me ask you this question. What do you do when you get caught up wishing your life looked like someone else's? You know, you're, you're... scrolling through a social media account and you see somebody seems to be living their best life and you feel like right now you're just not living your best life. Well, they say comparison is the thief of joy. So it's easy to envy other people's lives. It might look like they have it all together on their Instagram, but in reality, honestly, they probably don't. Therapy is a way to help you focus on you and what you want instead of what others have so you can start living your best life. I have benefited incredibly um, from therapy. And the therapy that I have done has been exclusively online. Uh, It's convenient and it's helpful to find a person who matches for you. And therapy in general has made such a big difference for me and breaking down some of the barriers that I've had in in life. And if you are thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, to be flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. That's the really important thing. It can be difficult to find a therapist that works for you. And when you spend a lot of time even finding the first one, you feel like, oh, I just need to stick it out with this one. But that's not the way to get the best therapy you can. The way to get the best therapy you can is by finding someone who truly does work for you. And being able to switch without having to worry about additional charge, that's what you need. So stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash TNW today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash TNW. And we thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All right, we are back from the break. And now it's time to talk about AI But AI in a less positive light, because this is AI that is um, making its way into an industry where you may not realize it's having such an impact. Joining us to talk about how AI is already taking jobs in the video game industry is Brian Merchant, who wrote uh, this piece for Wired. Welcome, Brian. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, pleasure to have you here. So I would love to just uh, get right into this. We'll start with Activision um, and some of these other big game studios. You know, what what caused these studios to start integrating AI tools like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion into their their workflows in the first place? Yeah, I think in a word, it was the hype. It was the buzz. It seemed like the kind of the ascendant tech of the of, of the moment. This is you know, early 2023, everybody's talking about AI um, and why not give it a whirl? Um, And what my reporting has showed is that, you know, obviously the gaming industry is not a monolith. There are very different attitudes and different uh, sort of uh, opinions and approaches depending on, on the studio. But in particular, some studios like like Activision, uh, which is a focus of the piece, uh, seem to open its arms to using AI, at least internally, pretty early on um, using generative AI and sort of 
opening the doors to uh, to having its employees use stable diffusion and mid journey in particular to generate uh, images. Um, and through a succession of emails, you can kind of see uh, sort of the loosening of of the uh, of the sort of uh, restrictions on the kind of AI that that uh, gaming employees can use and and how much and when. Um, and it's really interesting to see um, because, you know, we have this hype going on in the, you know, in the tech press and the media and the business world. And then, you know, you have companies that are going to want to wait, be a little bit more cautious about how they deploy it for legal reasons, mm -hmm. for security reasons, for anything else. And then you have some that say, like, let's get on the train. Let's let's go now. So how have the, you know, kind of we've seen a lot of layoffs now in the video game industry and yeah. some would argue that the adoption of AI, even if it was just kind of dipping the toe in and getting in the hype, has played a role in actually uh, leading to those layoffs. Is that what you've seen uh, in, your, in your research? Yeah, what I'll say is that, you know, it's very sort of nebulous, right? It's a it's a little bit of a black box when you look at layoffs and it can happen for any number of reasons. And obviously none of the studios are saying, hey, we got rid of all these uh, workers uh, and we replaced them with AI, you know, isn't that great? So it's it's always sort of. Uh, you know, you have to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and you have to ask the workers, ask the people on the front lines. And uh, what I found in a lot of cases is that there may not be this clear directive where it's like, hey, we're replacing 50 percent of your colleagues with AI, get with the program. But we've had these mass layoffs and we'd really like you to start using this tool because we're, we are not going to be able to be as productive without your colleagues that are now gone. Can you familiarize yourself with using mid journey or using one of these sort of uh, the, these AI tools that can automate some of the tasks that they used to do? That's basically how uh, what we you know, the modern version of automation is playing out in a lot of workplaces and the video game industry is is, is no different. So I think it's extremely fair to say that, number one, a lot of the video game workers really feel um, and justifiably so based on the language of their superiors and uh, and and colleagues that that they've lost uh, people to AI that that they're being asked to make up some of the difference with AI tools that maybe managers aren't just um, just thinking that they can replace workers one to one. But, hey, there is this whole AI tool out there. You know, if we get rid of all these, then maybe we can lean on AI a little bit harder. And that's more what this translation, this transition is going to look like. It's not going to be an AI jobs apocalypse where the executive can just hit a button and then all of a sudden his workers are replaced by AI. It's going to be a bunch of these edge cases like this sort of filtering in as more and more, uh, you know, managers hope to sort of cut costs or prove to their uh, bosses that they can, uh, you know, you, you know, do more with a lower headcount. Yeah, let's let's uh, talk about some specifics, because, again, um, if I haven't mentioned it yet, everyone needs to go check out this piece on Wired and see all of the detail that has gone into this uh, reporting. It's it's great. And uh, you do talk about some specific instances where ooh, AI generated content has been used in games. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's starting to show up um, in, you know, one uh, first in, in the concept art. So there's it. That's what a lot of people don't see. You know, this happens behind the scenes when when a game is in development, you know, and you have new characters or new scenarios and you have artists, lots of artists. Um, it's a, you know, a great job for artists. It's a very desirable job. A lot of people train and work hard to get these jobs. Um, and they come up with the concept art that then, you know, developers turn into 3D renderings or into into playable characters in, in different environments. So that's one uh, that's one job that is sort of ripe for uh, for automation. Should a studio decide decide to do it? You know, one thing is that they can't always do the quality, uh, you know, or the originality to the level that uh, that some uh, studios might 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 be expecting, but it's really just kind of a margin call. So it depends if you want more stuff, more output for cheaper. That's an option that is um, unfortunately for for the artists and their perspective that, that they can that that is available to to, to managers. Um, but I think what you're referring to more is there are actual assets, uh, you know, that that are being sold that used to be something that an artist would uh, would design and is now 
made with Midjourney or made with a with a um, a generative AI tool. And on those, we're seeing like the sort of the assets like skins or character designs or things that you can buy on an online store. And uh, yeah, we were able to find some examples uh, on on the Call of Duty store, for example, of uh, for some designs and for skin some skins that if you go into the you know the metadata, you can look at this was it's attributed to uh, Mid Journey. Um, and again, that's a call that the studios have to make because it's still very much an open question whether or not legally, you know, they can they can own that IP. Uh, I think the the courts have sort of uh, ha have decided right now that if something is generated by an AI system, then then it cannot be owned. Uh, whether or not it's you know you need to uh, attribute the artists. Sorry, sounds like a little siren going by over here. Um, but you you can't uh you, you know you it, it's unclear whether or not it's going to be a uh you know a, a a a something that the studios can rely on to do on mass if they hope to own the copyright of this output but again for skins and stuff that people are just going to buy or find in loot boxes or whatever else the lower you know then then i think that that's why it's starting to show up there but again these are things that real artists used to do used to be paid to do and now that that's where we're starting to see um some of the the work being replaced by ai yeah so you talked about the sort of legal legal no legal implications uh there for the 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 company side of things what are some of the ethical concerns that the developers and the artists have talked about when it comes to the use of AI in game development? And is it the same as we're kind of seeing elsewhere from artists that, you know, a lot of this might be trained on actual works from people without their permission? Uh, is, the, is the rallying cry the same? Huge concern. Yeah, I mean, that's something that our, I think in the our artist community, um, in, you know, the, uh, the writing community, to some extent, the graphic design community, there, I, this is just, this is the thing, right? This is... Uh, these AI tools, uh, these systems have been trained on, on, in some cases, their work, a lot of, you know, some of the better known artists or artists who have put a lot of uh, work out onto the web have been able to go into these systems, especially earlier on before there were, you know, safeguards or things that were, that would prevent, uh, you know, users from just putting in, you know, give me the, the work in the style of, you know, whoever, Molly Crabapple or whatever, and it would do it. And you could find, you could see it just replaced one to one. Um, and, and so since the earliest days of these tools emergence, this has been like the sort of top line ethical concern. It's been used, it's been it's vacuumed up their work, it's been trained on their work, and it is now being used to help sort of put them out of a job, right? It's being used to compete with them. And in fact, we'll see, we see this as an argument that's being made, not just in the artistic community, but it's one of the key planks of the New York Times lawsuit against open AI, that not only is this trained on our journalists' work, which we had to, you know, which, which had to be done um, at great expense, but now it's directly competing with our uh, existing journalists and it can be done much cheaper. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a counter to some of the fair use argument there. But yeah, no, artists are up in arms. I it's I have not seen a reaction to a piece that ha, that has been this strong. Um, maybe maybe ever people emailing me, people tweeting at me, people sliding into my DM saying this is happening at my workplace. Like this already happened. Like I'm worried that this is happening here. I've heard from people who do translation for video games. I've heard from animators. I've heard from illustrators, people who are just, you know, it's, and to them, it's not, it's, you know, you, you, I'm sure your audience is probably used to thinking about AI as a technical product and thinking about what it can and can't do and in what use cases and what's cool about, but to them, to a lot of these artists, it, that it, it, the use case that they're seeing is this is taking my work. This was trained on my work. I hate this. Like this should not exist. It, it's, it is an, it is, it's not, you know, there's, and I, and I understand it. And I, I feel like in a lot of ways, they're justified in having this, this, this response to it because it feels like a very um, existential threat to them. And it feels like already very precarious industry. Um, you know, nobody really asked them open AI, mid journey, stable, uh, stable diffusion. Uh, they, the, the folks who made these tools didn't, 
in in a, in a large in, in any sort of concerted or major meaningful way reach out to the artist first and say hey like we have this tool what do you what do you think about this now instead it's you know the same old story we hear from critics of silicon valley all the time it was made and it's being used and they don't have a say and now they're afraid and they're really really sincerely afraid understand um we are going to take a super quick break before we come back with the rest of my interview with brian merchant of wired i want to take a moment to tell you about panoptica who are bringing you this episode of tech news weekly panoptica it's cisco's cloud application security solution which provides end-to-end -end life cycle protection for cloud native application environments for those of you who got every single one of those words you are very excited right now because it empowers organizations to safeguard their apis their serverless functions their containers, their Kubernetes environments. Panoptica ensures comprehensive cloud security, compliance, and monitoring at scale, offering deep visibility, contextual risk assessments, and actionable remediation insights for all of your cloud assets. Powered by graph-based technology, Panoptica's attack path engine prioritizes and offers dynamic remediation for vulnerable attack vectors, helping security teams quickly identify and remediate potential risks across cloud infrastructures. A unified cloud-native security platform minimizes gaps from multiple solutions, providing centralized management and reducing non-critical vulnerabilities from fragmented systems. Panoptica utilizes advanced attack path analysis, root cause analysis, and dynamic remediation techniques to reveal potential risks from an attacker's viewpoint. This approach identifies new and known risks, emphasizing critical attack paths and their potential impact. Panoptica provides several key benefits for businesses at any stage of cloud maturity, including advanced CNAP, multi-cloud compliance, end-to-end -end visualization, the ability to prioritize with precision and context, dynamic remediation, and increased efficiency with reduced overheads. Visit panoptica.app to learn more. That's panoptica, P-A-N-O-P-T-I-C-A dot app, A-P-P, -P, panoptica dot app. And we thank Panoptica for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All right, we are back from the break and Brian Merchant of, excuse me, and Brian Merchant of Wired is here to talk about how AI is having a significant impact on the video game industry. Uh, my next question for you, Brian, uh, how have the introduction of AI tools changed the way that concept art and other design elements are created i mean you, you talked a little bit about this earlier but is do you think that that is going to be the way of things going forward now when it comes to concept art that where before you know you'd talk to one or multiple artists about an idea that you had and they worked and they made this happen is it just going to be now these these i don't know pr production minded folks are going to go to ai first and then take it to the artist um has it made that significant of an impact on the industry boy i mean that's the million dollar question right there uh because you know again i think it's going to be different depending on the studio that you talk to and uh, uh, there are some you know, studios that really just not only, you know, cherish the original development of art, um, but who are known for, you know, for the, the richness of their art, you know, studios like, um, you know, Blizzard and have this rich lore and all this, this original art. Um, and so uh, the fact that, you know, that they have uh, an AI tool and internal AI tool has uh, ruffled a lot of feathers, has made people a lot of angry, made people made people involved in the creative process at Blizzard really angry. So I think at, what's going to happen is there's going to be just a number of different sort of uh, scrums inside these companies where there will be a lot to work through. I think some of the bigger ones where you, you know, so much it's it's one of the sort of the, the factors that I, I kind of mentioned in the piece, but don't go into too, too deeply. But the fact that a significant portion of the video game, the American video game industry has consolidated under Microsoft at this point. You know, you have Microsoft, which owns Activision and Blizzard, which own all of these other studios nesting underneath it. And Microsoft is, of course, a partner with OpenAI and one of the sort of most aggressive and leading purveyors of, of generative AI technologies. So there is 
at some level going to be, you know, a corporate directive to use these tools. And a lot of the workers I spoke to said that those are already coming down. You have to do co-pilot trainings. You have to get used to using, um, you know, AI tools in different capacities. But again, how it all sort of works out on a, on a level of the nitty gritty in a, each given studio, I think is going to be the product of a number of, of decisions. And it's going to be, you know, legal decisions too. Like we still don't know on the copyright end, if this this is all going to get a, a huge curveball if the courts rule that no, this is not fair use. That that AI companies have to uh, have to figure out some way to get consent or uh, even compensate, uh, or, you know, work uh, that has been ingested into their tools. That's going to change everything, and it makes it a lot harder to to use these tools for a creative, uh, public facing purpose. So I just think that there's a ton of unanswered questions, uh, and it's going to vary studio to studio. Studio. And in another piece that I did uh, for the Atlantic a, a month or so ago, there's also this sort of growing movement of sort of stamping like no AI, like this is an AI free product on your output, especially creative output. So it could stand to reason that certain studios uh, that have had more aggressive anti AI, you know, uh, stances might sort of just use that as, you know, kind of a badge, like, no, all the art you see here is going to be made by humans, it's going to be mm. uh, you know, it's going to be uh, really created by the the human creative spirit, and that's maybe hopefully something we you know consumers will want to pay more for. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a big unknown. Uh, I wish non GMO uh, video exactly. games. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I think the the last thing I'll ask because you did touch on those kind of potential long term impacts, and you also touched on how maybe some game studios uh, are trying not to do this as much. Can you just briefly talk about, you know, we've seen unionization take place in the game industry in certain areas and not in others. How often is AI a clause that is part of the, the union agreement? And do we think that's kind of the next battleground there? I think it's a big one. And I for for this piece, I spoke to some union organizers and they say that it's a major catalyst, right? Like there is a uh, there was an organizing panel at, at the big uh, game development conference this year, the GDC, which is the major sort of uh, video game development conference. Um, uh, that that's held annually and AI was like by far the leading uh, source of questions like you know what are we doing about the fact that AI is coming down the pike how do we deal with that and you know I think it is it's it's really hard it's it's really hard uh because we just historically even our you know unions even unionized workplaces often have difficulty sort of confronting automation when it's uh when it's coming down the pike in, in a um in a sort of a, a holistic or a way that really matters one example is the wga which they actually did get in their contract the, the writers guild of america who went on strike last year of course and one of the big fighting uh points that they that they were rallying around was the studios wanting to reserve the right to use AI to generate scripts or in screenwriting. And they fought back and they said, no, if you if any if we're going to use AI, we have to be the ones to decide how to do it. So that's kind of a model. The WGA is unusually powerful for a creative union. There aren't a whole lot of analogs, as you mentioned, like gaming is not very unionized. Um, it is uh, it, there's a lot of interest in it. It's growing. Um, and you, what you, what the hope would be is that you can, you can find a, a way to organize a workplace. So it's not just like zero AI, like get, we want to ban AI because there's a lot of people in these studios. Also something we haven't talked about engineers, you know, software developers, people who will say like, actually AI is good for me. And it's not autom it's not automating anyone's job away, but it is making it easier for me to to write code or to run patches or to do any number of things. So what you need is, uh, you know, ideally an organized workplace, whether formally or not ideally formally that you can sort of make these decisions together where one worker can consent to AI and say, hey, this is helpful over here, not over here. I'd really feel better about it if we would just keep AI out of the concept art uh, department. But if the engineers want to do it, that's cool. Because right now it's kind of a free for all and it gets muddled by various corporate directives at different levels and it creates chaos and confusion and ultimately sometimes job loss. Mm. 
Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I know that it's very late where you are, so I really appreciate you making the time to join us and for writing this piece. Again, everybody should head over to wired.com to check it out. If folks want to keep up to date with what you're doing, is there any place they can go online to follow you? Yeah, I write a newsletter called bloodinthemachine.com. It's also the name of my last book that incidentally explores some of these issues. Um, and yeah, it's my pleasure to do it. If I'm sweating, it's because I'm in the south of France. It's hot. There's no AC, but my pleasure. Happy, happy well, to thank you. Cheer. Yeah, cheers. All righty, folks, that's going to bring us to the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. The show publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That is where you can go to subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. If you would like to get all of our shows ad free, well, you might want to check out Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit. Just $7 a month gets you access to every single Twit show, including this one with no ads, plus access to the Twit Plus bonus feed, plus access to to the Twit Plus bonus feed, uh, which has a whole bunch of extra content that you won't find anywhere else behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, special club Twit events all get uh, published there and access to the members only Discord server, a fun place to go to chat with your fellow club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. You also will get access to the video versions of our club Twit shows, including the Untitled Linux show, Hands on Mac, hands on Windows, iOS today. If you want to see those episodes, then you'll need to become a member of Club Twit. Lastly, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that you're helping to support what we do here at Twit. Thank you so much for considering subscribing. Twit.tv slash Club Twit, just seven bucks a month. If you'd like to follow me online, I'm at Micah Sargent on many a social media network where you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. And be sure to check out those other shows I mentioned, Hands on Mac, iOS Today, and the show I do with Leo every Sunday, Ask the Tech Guys, where we take your questions live on air and do our best to answer them. Thank you so much for being here and I will not be back next week. Emily Dry Belbus will be back next week, but uh, her and Abrar Alhiti are going to have a great show for you. And I'll see you all again in two weeks. Thank you and bye.